going to be talking about uh, some archaeological investigations that we did at the Halsey Street Methodist Episcopal Church and Cemetery in Newark. It's right downtown in Newark. And um, we did this work in 2017 and finished the report in, I think, 2019. Um, it all came about because of Rutgers University Newark campus uh, proposing to build a new Honors Living Learning Center, uh, which is a big dorm with uh, classrooms and all that sort of stuff. And it's, it's um, you can see that on the aerial, it's all in an existing parking lot. Um, this is mine. Oh, you can see my green, that's great. Um, if, you know, if you've ever been down to this part of the university section, this is McGovern's Tavern, which you can see is sectioned out from the project and remain there. Um, and um, we went in because um, the site is part of the James Street Historic District. And um, not actually because of any sort of anticipated archaeology at first. Um, because it's part of the James Street Historic District, they had to uh, uh, apply for a New Jersey State Register Act application for project authorization. And when the SHPO was reviewing the project, they saw a 2005 report that Hunter Research had done, and we have largely forgot about, where we looked at several properties in Newark, and we had mentioned that this property has uh, a moderate to high archaeological sensitivity um, because it may contain domestic remains from houses and could contain burials near the center of the block. So that's why we got a call from the developer to come and have a look at the property. And um, we were hired by a company called RBH Project, who were the developer for Rutgers in 2017. Um, and uh, they were required to do this, this work by the SHPO. And their main concern was whether there were burials left in the Halsey Street uh, Cemetery. Um, and I'm just going to read just the little history we have that explains this, this block. Um, this is a 1905 shot of the, of the church. It was, um, the church was removed in 1970s, I think. Um, and, and then there's a nice, uh, a good uh, map here that shows the church and then the big lot behind it. And um, we're also going to be looking at some of these, the backs of some of these houses that range along New Street. Um, the city block encompassing the project site is partially defined within Newark's late 17th century town plan. The block began to undergo serious development in the early federal period following the layout of, a, of New Street around 1790 and Halsey Street in the first decade of the 19th century. Halsey Street Methodist Episcopal Church and Cemetery, which were the principal focus of this investigation, date from 1808 to 1809. So the first church was built on site in 1808. Um, that is a much smaller church than the one you see here. We have, we've gotten one that, one graphic that might show an image of the earlier church, but the earlier church was actually much smaller and kind of like just took up the front of this lot. And that, that plays into some of what we found later on. The church trustees expanded the cemetery in the early 1830s, acquired more land adjoining the church lot to the north in 1850, which facilitated the replacement of the original house of worship with a new and larger church building in 1852. That's the one you see there. The cemetery remained in active use for burial purposes until around 1870. And then in conjunction with an episode of burial disinterment in 1926, it was paved over and converted into a parking lot. Uh, the, the church itself was demolished in, in 1952. So um, someone did go in there and disinter all the remains in 1926. So there shouldn't be anybody left in the ground back there. And that was the view of the developer. And, and so our first plan was to go in and, and just test uh, and see if, oh, see if anybody was uh, still in the ground. This is a, a site, a, a photo from 1924 that the only photo we have that shows the burial ground behind the cemetery, so behind that church. And then this is another shot of them disassembling what was actually the first public school in Newark, which is back on the back corner of the, lo the block. But you can see the backyard of the church and it's a, it's a parking lot at this time. And it was a parking lot for Han and Co, a, a downtown sort of a retailer in Newark. So we went in and this is the sort of phase one investigation. We, we excavated 
two trenches and three test pits. And we expected to find grave shafts. I mean, we knew this was a cemetery. And then we were going to go and select a certain percentage of grave shafts and dig down into them to see if remains were still present. And, um, and they were. You can see in this photo here, here's some of the grave shafts. There's one, they're in a line. There's another one here, another one here and here. There's also some sort of uh, other, this is, you know, it, there's a lot of different patterns here going on in the soil. There's a lighter brown here. And uh, the subsequent, um, we did find human remains uh, in some of our little test pits into the, um, into the burial, into the grave shafts. And we consulted with the New Jersey Historic Preservation Office. And we decided to, that if there's, if there's a few, there are four out of 20, I think, of the grave shafts we looked at had human remains in them. What we decided to do with the shippo is strip all the parking lot off and strip the whole thing down. So we removed all the pavement within the bounds of the historic cemetery. And we got on our knees and started to trowel. And, uh, and boy, did we trowel. And we identified a lot of uh, grave shafts. Now, I'm going to show human remains, skeletal remains. I just wanted to just give everybody an a, um, update about that. So when we first started doing the, the phase two uh, stripping of the whole site, we identified a lot of empty grave shafts, uh, including this empty crypt here, um, which was the only crypt we ever we found on site after digging 100% of it. And then we also started finding uh, these intact burials. Okay, um, at this point, we realized that um, they couldn't build here unless these remains were removed. And that there was a chance that there were remains in each of the many grave shafts that we identified. So there wasn't much other choice than to completely excavate the cemetery. So um, in March, we um, got a writ from the chancellery court to allow us to move the bodies. Um, and we began um, to, to dig the entire cemetery. Um, and that, that court order was very important. It's when we first started excavating and removing bodies, we were driving back and forth to Trenton and taking, you know, 15, 20 boxes of remains to Trenton. And we kind of realized, what, what if we get stopped by a cop? <laughs> and then and they asked, what, what, what are in all these file boxes? Um, you have to have that court order with you. Um, it became very clear to us uh, and uh, just something you don't think about on a normal project. So uh, excavation began. Um, this is uh, shows the crew um, and and what kind of work it was. We, we stripped off the top few feet with a machine, a, a very large machine. We had an excellent operator. And we, we, we saw as the grave shafts became more and more obvious, we would get in there and start excavating by hand. And then once the remains were uncovered, we really got in and got on our knees and, and laid on our stomachs and, and excavated these remains with um, you know, um, small picks, some trowels, sharpened sticks. Um, we'd get all the loose material that was not skeletal and, and we'd vacuum out sections of it. And it's very, it was very laborious work. Um, and then once everything was cleared down and exposed as much as possible, we did a very detailed burial record form that that's sort of a, a, an amalgamation of several forms that we've looked at. We took a million photos of each uh, uh, set of remains, uh, and then we did drawings of each set of remains. And, and these actually became very important because these remains were not in great condition. Um, when we, with some of them, you know, the bones, you could pick up the long bones and they held under their own weight. A lot of them were, had a mealy consistency or the consistency of maybe wet cardboard. So once they were removed, they were not, they're never going to go back together again. Um, they were in very poor condition. And then once those wet cardboard type remains dried out, they really fell apart. They were very friable. And, and this, these record sheets, uh, are super important. The way we drew them, the way you can scale uh, using uh, programs on computers to measure the length of bones, long bones and stuff using photographs. It turned out to be um, very vital to our analysis. 
In, in the end, we identified 335 burials. Um, and the, we, we think they, they, ex, they removed about 130, they said, in 1927. And uh, they didn't do a very good job. Uh, we think they may have spent most of their time removing the stones, and not necessarily burials. Although we, there are, we also think that many of these might have been marked with um, wooden uh, grave markers. And, and they did, there was no marker to be had because we didn't find very many markers on site, just a few fragments. Okay, of the 335 burials, uh, 138 were largely complete skeletons. Uh, the remaining were fairly disturbed. And um, we think they were largely disturbed when they were doing the disinterments. Um, so we had several different kinds of burials. We had primary burials. So the one in the top right, top left, is a primary burial. The whole body's there. That one is, I put that one up there because it's strangely the only one we found on its side. It was, uh, they all, most of them had shroud pins. We were able to find uh, coffin nails in many of the, many of the uh, graves, but we did not find a lot of coffins. The, the only, only really good coffin we found is the one in the, in the center photo. Uh, there, was, there was some coffin hardware. Um, the, the bottom uh, left is a reinterment box. This is a box with several individuals in it. Uh, we think up to about 10. And, um, and then there's also in the top right are, are several reinterment smaller boxes that each had a set of remains in them. So um, we think these are probably coming from the earlier cemetery that was around the smaller church. And that when they expanded the, the church, they actually took the remains that were right around it and moved them out, put them in boxes and moved them out into the other, into the backyard in the large part of the cemetery. At first we thought, oh, maybe these are civil war dead coming home or something like that, but there's no records that suggest that. So we, we believe these are probably from the cemetery and that they were moved into the backyard. In the bottom right there, that poor guy, uh, he butts, his legs were in the way of the builder's trench for the, the 1852 church. So they probably were digging that builder's trench to put the wall in, found his legs sticking out, bundled all the bones together, and kind of stuffed them all together right there. So we have, we have primary burials, reinterments, uh, we have partial reinterments, and then we also had a, a, a good number of uh, miscellaneous remains that were not in boxes or not in grave shafts that were just found across the site. You know, sort of smaller pieces, some articulated, some not, that we tended, we, you know, they fit in Tupperware containers. Um, so a whole, a, diff a big variety of, of different kinds of burials. Um, and again, we had some coffin hardware. Um, this is a, a pretty fancy um, uh, coffin handle. Um, uh, on the right there are several uh, coffin screws. We also had a lot of coffin nails. And these are screw caps, the sort of a decorative cap that goes on the end of the screw on the, on the box. But very few actual wood, um, like I said, wood remaining. There, you can see dark stains of coffins, but no wood that you could actually pick up out of the ground, except for that one. Um, also, um, very few uh, burial artifacts. Um, we did get recover these gold earrings from one of the one of the sets of one of the barrels, and then we also found this gold denture plate, which is a solid gold plate you put in your mouth. It's a pretty amazing little item to find. I believe it was from inside of a skull, remains of a skull that was recovered. Um, we also uh, were able once we got the re uh, remains back to the lab, we were able to identify thirty years. 33, I believe, sets of remains that were solid enough that we could analyze the remains. And that was done by Dr. Del Preet, who's a Monmouth University um, uh, professor. And uh, she and her students um, uh, and a couple of people that, was, that were working for Hunter Research and being taking classes at Monmouth were able to look at these uh, remains and give us some information. And they're actually pretty telling. Um, and it's sort of things you'd expect from mid 19th century downtown Newark uh, Cemetery, Methodist Cemetery. Um, the, the woman uh, whose legs are at the top left, um, you can see the bowed femurs. 
and the right tibia is bowed. And this is probably a sign of um, rickets. Um, the pitted teeth in the skulls on the uh, top right, uh, probably a sign of hypoplasia or um, nutritional deficiency. And um, uh, in the bottom uh, left, uh, you can see that the lower mandible has completely um, um, resorbed, uh, uh, absorbed all the, the former um, teeth. Um, there's one, there was one cavity left. Um, uh, so the person, you know, might have, might have had their own denture plate. Um, and then on the other, on the bottom right, um, we have a series of teeth. Um, the top ones are sort of the normal white discolored ones that we, we found in a lot of the graves. The, the bottom ones are, when you look at them, they're very gray. They're almost as if they're, um, they're like colored in or shaded in. And they're all um, subadults. And there was a row of subadults that had these gray teeth. And we think it may relate to them being treated with uh, potentially a mercury-based medicine, um, maybe during one of the cholera epidemics that, that was in Newark. Maybe they were part of an orphanage or something like that, got hit by uh, that kind of thing. And they were all being treated the same way. Unfortunately, um, they didn't make it. Um, so uh, one of the things we took out of this, because the remains were so poor, dental uh, pathologies became very important. Um, and it's something I'd stress. Um, we were only able to identify one person in the cemetery. The records, the burial records, we had them for a few years. They were not specific as to where the, the remains were being placed. In this case, we had the burial records for 1839. And what you're looking at here is, uh, this is a child, and this is a board at the bottom of that child's coffin. That overlies the nameplate on the coffin below it. So the nameplate goes with the remains underneath here, and that nameplate says uh, clearly says Sarah Moore. And um, she lived on New Street, which is the next street up north. Uh, she died in 1839 of, of consumption. Um, we haven't found out, we haven't been able to find much else about uh, uh, her at all. Um, so yeah, it can be pretty grim. Um, there were other things on site as well. Um, this is the uh, this is showing the northern corner of of the church, and a series of buildings here that actually predate the church. And uh, this actually the southern wall gets knocked out when the church is expanded. The, there was a shoe shop in here. This guy taught geography and music to people. Um, there's a whole complicated system of uh, French drains and cisterns and wells here and in a nice little privy out back. Um, here's a, here's a, a sh just an example of what the um, drainage system looked like on the side of the church. And there's Josh Butchko, uh, the newsletter editor, uh, doing what he does best, getting in there with the machine and, and uh, excavating um, what turned out to be a cistern. This one is a brick lined. It's got, it has like a a, a grouted or mortar coated interior to hold water as opposed to a, a feature that would try to drain the water out. Um, then there were also other uh, historic remains within the block um, that all ranged along New Street. And you can see these addresses here, it's 56 to 46 New Street. All these privies out back. The houses were outside the project area, not going to be impacted. Um, or were already impacted, I believe. And uh, the, the cemetery with all the remains is back here. So we did do a, a project of uh, looking at these, these um, privies. And you can see there's test pits in each of the privies. We tried to figure out whether they had potential to, you know, they had a lot of material in them or whether they were just um, full of coal ash, like this one on the right is. This is one of the privies we took, took the side off of. And, uh, you know, we were doing what I think is pretty common practice now with these urban sites is to excavate with a machine down next to the privy and then disassemble it from the side. And then you can section the deposits. It, it worked very well at the site. As you can see, there's, there's mostly 
uh, coal ash with a little bit of lime down at the very bottom. And uh, I think Newark uh, had such a problem with disease that in the late 19th century, they, they actually installed their own sewer systems and they mandated that everyone downtown in certain, certain wards uh, close, fill and close all their pretties. So this is something we've run into in Newark before where there's privets that are just backfilled with a lot of material in one big go. Um, and, you know, uh, that's probably from that period. I think it's 1870s. Uh, the, on the left, that's a barrel. That's a very large barrel that we found um, stuck inside of a very, very rectangular pit that surrounded it. You can see how well this sort of cut shows. And this barrel ended up being full of uh, metalworking debris, slag, um, crucibles, uh, things like that. And that relates to a 10 or 15 year period where there was a building along New Street that ran as a metalworking shop. So um, it sort of ties in with the history of the site, uh, an interesting little feature. We expected it to be the bottom of the barrel privy, but it doesn't, doesn't appear to be. Um, then there's this guy. This is, this is a great privy. Um, this is a double. Um, and you can just see uh, right here, there's one opening there, one opening there. And it straddled a property line. So part of it was on 56 New Street, part of it was on, I think, 54. Um, yeah. And uh, so this is two different people going to their backyard and using their privy. And this is what the deposits look like underneath it. Uh, it's pretty interesting how it worked out. A lot of this is coal ash. A lot of it's lime, which I, I think might, you know, I, I dream about it being taken from Warren County on a canal boat across the state and sold to people in Newark. The canal's a couple blocks to the south uh, to, to, to um, sweeten their privies holes. But this also yielded a significant amount of material as well. Um, uh, for instance, the clock parts on the left there and that's a metal uh, child's bank. Um, lots of good ceramics that, that all came kind of fit together. A lot of doll parts. Um, there, there's some uh, thought that there might've been a tailor in one of the buildings and maybe he was putting these dolls together because a lot of the dolls were, you know, you get the ceramic hands and you get the ceramic head and you, you sort of make a little body and stuff it and put the, put the body together. It may have also been kids in the house, but there were a lot of doll heads and pieces of dolls in that one privy. Uh, oh, and we had uh, 20,000 artifacts all together from the cemetery and, and the privies and the backyards. Just a couple more um, images of some of, some of the artifacts we we'll go into detail. You know, your typical liniments in the middle. Um, there's on the, um, I really like that, the glass gun. What do you think they would have had in that? Liquor, men's cologne, no nope, toy, uh, kids candy. Yep, so, it was, <laughs> so that was full of candy. Um, then there's also, there's a nice, at the top of the, in the right, there's a slate pencil, uh, a, a piece of slate for, for us sketching notes on, and then a nice little ink bottle there. I thought that was a nice collection of artifacts. All right, so all of this material, has been put together in a report, um, 700 pages. It, it took quite the effort of, a, of a, my whole crew and everybody at the company. And we really appreciate how much work they put into it. Um, and that goes into a lot more um, analysis of the dis uh, distribution of remains, how they're buried, the uh, distribution of sex versus uh, age and depth. And it also compares it a lot with, with several um, 19th century burials in London, uh, burial grounds in London, which are really well published. They're a really great source for comparing it with stuff in the US where there aren't a lot of great reports on burial grounds like this. Um, but the, the Museum of London publishes these things pretty regularly. They're pretty cheap to get a hold of. Um, and they're very comparable. Um, the the um, report also includes a database, a burials database that has all the forms for all 335 individuals the drawings, everything we know about them. Um, and that report and all the data is available to download at hunterresearch.com. Okay, so what, what were some of the basic lessons learned? Again, this is just an overview of the site. 
But I think uh, there are a couple of things that I think, I don't know if they surprised us, but that it really drove home. And that's one of the main things is the remains don't correlate directly with the shaft features that we exposed right above the ground surface. We dug down in some of them and there was nobody home or we had the feet coming to the top of the feature. That you can't just uh, strip it all down, look at all, doc, document all the feature and say, okay, we've got 37 grape shafts here. That's what it's gonna take to do this. Um, and one of the reasons is because there are a lot of stacked burials in this graveyard. So not only um, an adult with child on top, but sometimes three adults on top, on top of each other. So in some cases, we think the people disinterring the remains dug down, maybe took the top person and didn't get down far enough to get the person underneath. And, and this actually, this, the disinterment also caused a lot of complications with the, the excavation and that, that first point is they would dig, they, you know, the people disinterring this were looking at the stones that were still there and they would dig down in front of it. Stones don't necessarily mark exactly where the remains are. They get the remains, they dig over to get the next person, they pull them out. And in a lot of cases, they were leaving skulls and feet and leg bones behind. They're taking out the center, center section of the remains and maybe they grab the stone and that was all they're removing. Um, and that goes back to the, um, the next point. Disinterred grave shafts are not likely to be empty. You need to excavate the entire grave shaft. We found a lot of remains that were, the center section was missing or the legs were missing but the rest of the remains were there and you need to dig the whole grave shaft to make sure it's empty. Um, and then documenting the remains in situ, in place, um, it was really important because these remains were, these remains were just falling apart in the lab at, that you need to document them as soon as you clear them off and, and expose them. They're not gonna be, you're not gonna be able to take them, uh, it depends on the sites soil chemistry, lots of factors, but you're not gonna be able to take them and lay them out on a table perfectly to match how you excavated them out of the ground. So documenting them in situ is really important. Uh, the importance of dental analysis with the remains, so many of the bones were so friable that the teeth were a really important way of figuring out what was going on. Age, uh, pathologies, um, in ethnicity potentially, um, the dental analysis is something we put a, we beef up our budget with a lot more of that in our in the next next one we did. Um, I guess this isn't surprising, but there were a large number of subadult burials. Uh, the mortality rate I think was about twenty percent in Newark around this time. We had twenty seven point eight percent of the remains we found were subadult. And then finally, the biggest point is is and then this ties to the title unquiet slumbers for the sleepers is that these cemeteries are not static. Um, they don't, you don't have a big yard and you put a person in the ground and then you calmly put the next person in the ground. It doesn't, they don't stay that way because they get reburied. They get excavated to put another burial in. They get, the buildings move, the fence line moves. They build a, build a put a building in next door that disturbs the, the, the guy's legs out of the, uh, out of his burial. These things are, are, are active. Um, and it creates a very complex archaeological record. Um, I just threw this in here for the archaeologists. This is um, uh, Andy Martin, I think, trying to keep track of all the features in two grid squares. These are two 20-foot grid squares. There were 40-some grid squares on this site. And this is us trying to just track where the burials are. And, and you look in there, and you can see some things that are burial-shaped. There's a lot of things that aren't burial-shaped. And they have to do with reinterments. They have to do with the sockets of gravestones that have been removed. But, you know, it's just incredibly sort of complex archaeology. And you really need to take that into account. Um, there is a good, good uh, ending to this. Uh, the remains, all of them, including all the personal effects, including the nameplate, including the earrings and dental, uh, and the denture plate, all of that was reburied. Um, and it was reburied about 100 feet away from where the rest of the remains were reburied in 1926. So um, this was paid for by the developer and by Rutgers. We had a ceremony. Um, all the remains were individually packaged in, um, in, in paper bags, and then they fit into 18 coffins. So they bought nine concrete vaults, 18 coffins, and they buried them and they put a, uh, they had a memorial marker.
on the on the site. So it does kind of end. I feel like we did well by them. I feel like we removed everybody that was in that parking lot in that cemetery, and that they've been reunited as much as possible with the rest of the remains. Um, and finally, just wanted to thank a lot of people that worked on this. There's a shot of the crew. Um, we, yeah, I think Alexis is there. I don't know if anybody else here is there. You're not there. I'm not there. For that one, yeah. <laughs> and then especially uh, Josh Butchko down there at the bottom and Andy Martin up at the top, uh, who were the field directors for the work. And was that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, that's about it. Thank you all for uh, uh, listening to me. Um, I hope you uh, enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them.